Hey friends, welcome to Ivy's Fortress. Welcome back to Teen Rest and Read. As I reminded you the first time, I'm Ashanti, and the reason why I want to do Teen Rest and Read is because I used to love falling asleep reading books. It would make my dreams so vivid, so colorful, and it would kind of enter me into the world of the book that I was reading. So, without further ado, we're going to get back into Black Girl Unbossed. I don't know if I left a bookmark in this page, in this book, but I know where I left off. Oh, I did! <laughs> We're prepared! So, Black Girl Unbossed by Chrissy Lauren Adams, Part 2. We have 10 page read. So, let's go ahead and turn this page. My dog is playing with his toy, her toy. All right. So our next human is Amara Ifeji. The outdoors is not just a place for an individual who looks this way or has these resources. It is a human right. Man, sister. Amara Ifeji, Ifeji environmental justice activist. Ooh. Shifting the narrative, the environmental ethics of Amara Ifeji. I started off exploring in the dirt and up until I was 18 years old, I was still playing in the dirt, Amara Fiji says, laughing. In her 18 years, Amara has already made a significant impact as a climate and racial justice activist. A profile piece for a daily Maine newspaper wrote of her prominence, saying, as she gra graduates from Bangor High School, Nigerian born Amara Fiji leaves behind a legacy of scientific achievement and social change. The article summarized the impact Amara has had in the small corner of the country known as Bangor, Maine. Amara was born in Nigeria in 2001 and her family moved to the United States in 2004. They first lived in Maryland. When Amara was nine, they moved to Maine. I love Maine so much, Amara says. It has afforded me opportunities I want to be a part of that, uh, of that progressive change to make the state I love a better place to live, work, and raise a family. However, Amara is disappointed by the slow progress the state has made regarding issues such as racism, equity, and inclusion. Amara didn't always love Maine. In fact, she spent most of her adolescence wanting to leave the state. Maine is almost 95% white. Black people make up less than 2% of the population with other races and ethnicities making up another 2%. Sadly, some of Amara's experience growing up as a young black girl is Maine is included in racism. In Maine included racism. Ooh, jumbled me up. Two weeks after nine-year-old Amara first moved to the state, she was playing a game on the playground with some of her peers. When she won the game, she was elated, but that excitement faded after a boy called her a racial slur. How mean. As Amara grew up and attended the local school system, she continued to observe racism and discrimination in various forms. She was tired of walking through the halls of her school and be hearing the N-word. The racism also extended beyond the school walls. In Maine, there are many sundown towns where I can just really not be found after a certain time. Those are the kind of things that my mother was fearful of. People who harbored hate for people who look like me. Amara wasn't satisfied with leaving things as they were. She optimistically saw herself as a part of the change that she desired to see in Maine. She actively worked to create that change by leading racial advocacy efforts, which led to policy change in her school. Amara has spoken publicly about her experiences for the Bangor City Council and School Committee. One presentation moved to the school board and she was able to organize the first diversity and inclusion panel discussion at her high school. The panel focused on creating a space to discuss issues of discrimination at her school. In September 2019, Amara launched the Multicultural Student Union, a group of Black, Indigenous, People of Color students who convened once a week to discuss their lived experiences and issues at school. She also founded the Minority Student Union, which aims to bring about change by creating a space for all students to work on developing cultural competence. Amara's identity as a Black Indigenous person of color, individual living in Maine, goes hand in hand with her passion for advocating for racial justice. 
Her passion for environmental issues is also closely linked to her upbringing in Maine, a state of vast forests, wetlands, mountains, and other natural landscapes. Racism on playgrounds. Black girls across the country have long been subjected to racism on playgrounds at their schools and in their neighborhoods. The incidents can start unhealthy cycles of self-hatred and the hurt and humil humiliation from the in incidents can be long lasting. I wasn't embarrassed about what that kid said, Amara says. I was embarrassed because I was black. I was embarrassed because I was only one of three black kids at my 400 plus elementary school. That started a cycle of me struggling to come to terms with the fact that I am something that is very apparent, black. I think it's kind of disturbing that like sometimes our physical appearance outweighs our spirit and our character as people. That That's hard to live with. I empathize with that. Environmental activism. Though Amara learned about ecosystems and man, Maine's landscape in school, she didn't receive much environment-focused education, so she sought out opportunities to educate herself. While in high school, Amara attended an event with the Maine Environmental Change Makers Association, a youth-led intergenerational network that connects young Mainers, ages 15 to 30, from diverse backgrounds who are passionate about the environment with peer mentors and established professional mentors in the sector. The event shifted Amara's perspective on the environment from a science-based one to a social one. There, she learned about damage to the environment and the disproportionate impact that this damage has on marginalized communities. Amara also realized that her passions for environmental activism and racial justice were inseparable. Amara began remembering past experiences that clearly demonstrated a link between the environment and racial and economic injustice. She remembers not being able to afford snow boots and pants and how this prevented her from connecting with her environment during the winter months. Amara also remembers missing out on environmental outings because of the expenses of her, fam her family was not able to afford. She says that the stigma around black people skiing or camping also influenced her decision to not engage in those outdoor activities. Amara also recounts her mother's fear about her going outside, especially at night because of the danger simply being outside at night can pose to black people. This evokes the memory of the 2012 murder of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, who was fatally shot while walking through a neighborhood on his way back from a convenience store. Trayvon was guilty of nothing more than being black and walking with his hood up in the evening. The fear black people feel of going outside is another example of an intersectional environmental and social justice issue. If I did not recognize that there was a link between social justice and environmental issues, I don't really think that I would be in this work. These aren't two different things that I'm working towards making better. They are one. Amen, sister. The overlapping issues Amara speaks of are known as environmental racism. Large segments of the population are disproportionately affected by environmental barriers. Because of this disparity, Amara strives to be a change maker within the world of the environmental activism and environmental equity. She is committed to helping ensure that all people have protection from environmental hazard and access to the environment. Eventually, Amara, Amara evolved from a young woman interested in environmental issues to a climate justice activist. During high school, Amara was involved in the Bangor High School STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math program which tackled issues such as water quality and heavy metal pollution. Amara even participated in an independent research project that focused on the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, by trying to resolve heavy metal con contamination in drinking water. Flint still does not have clean drinking water. So if you can find a way that, to advocate or um, support the residents of Flint, Michigan. Okay, back to the read. Later, Amara became president of the Stormwater Management and Research Team, SMART. SMART is a youth-led water quality management team which aids to provide female students with opportunities to explore environmental STEM. Environmental equity. Land is a source of livelihood, providing essential food and water for black people. Land is also an important part of our historical identity and spirituality. Our African ancestors believed land was a gift from God. Because of this, 
They took great pride in the land and saw themselves as stewards of God's resources. Unfortunately for Black Americans, slavery forced our ancestors to work the land and build the infrastructure of America with sweat and blood and no reward. Amar explains those who are typically affected by things like natural disasters and environmental phenomena are Black, Indigenous, people of color individuals. Especially when one of three African American individuals lives within 30 miles, 48 kilometers of a coal plant. Coal as in C-O-A-L. Sometimes people think I have an accent and I don't pronounce my words correctly. For her work in environmental justice, Amara was awarded the Maine Environmental Education Association Student of the Year Award. Good for her. Her research projects, which have won numerous awards, centered on methods of water purification. Amara's dedication to intersectional environmentalism led her to become a grassroots development coordinator with the Maine Environmental Changemakers Association. In this role, Amara continues to advocate for intersectional climate change climate justice solutions through various programs and initiatives. Through my work, I've led efforts to allow individuals, especially those from marginalized backgrounds, to recognize that the environment and the outdoors is not just a place for an individual who looks this way or has these resources. It is a human right. Amara Fiji continues that legacy of Black Americans returning to the land by teaching that we all have an ethical responsibility to protect its sacredness because our land is very much sacred. Unbossed lessons, what we can learn from Amara of Fiji. Ethical leadership. An ethical leader is guided by their values, beliefs, and principles. They respect and serve others, are honest, and work to build community. Amara has a clear code of ethics, one that celebrates inclusivity and justice. What is your code of ethics? How can you be an ethical leader in your community? Amara loves constructive criticism. Amara loves her community dearly. Because of this love, she was keenly aware that there were things she wanted to change. Amara's criticism didn't come from an intent to cause harm, but from a desire to see something she loved become even better. We can be critical of the things we love when we include truth and ethics in our critique. Everyone belongs. Amara not only believes everyone has a place in the outdoors, but also believes everyone has a place in our society at large. Amara strives to be inclusive of all individuals and all communities. What can you do to be more welcoming of others around you? Define your own story. Amara experienced discrimination throughout her childhood. This treatment affected the way she saw herself, but Amara learned to reject the negative stories others were using to define her and she created her own story. Amara learned to define herself as well as the meaning of identity in her own terms. By the time she graduated from high school, she stood out in a different way, making an extraordinary name for herself in Maine and beyond. Well, I appreciate Amara Fiji's work and I hope that she continues to do great work in her community of environmental climate justice. Well, that's all we have today. I want you also to remember readers, and if you continue reading, please go ahead, let me know what you think of this book. But I want you all to know that when we talk about these girls, black girls unbossed, the young leaders that are changing the world and leading the way, their stories are not happening in isolation. They are receiving help from their peers, their friends, their cousins, their aunties, their aunties, their uncles, or everybody, especially their parents, guardians, whoever's taking care of them. So no, if you may not be the most innovative, interested person in society and your goal is not to create, innovate, or invent, then you can always support. And if your goal is to innovate, invent, or create then guess what do it and the people that are meant to be there will find their way into your life to support you look out for community outreach programs look out for people interested in supporting you but always be on the lookout for bringing everyone together while you achieve your mission well that's all i have today and i hope i catch you guys next time 
for our teen rest and read, we'll do part three of Black Girls Unbossed. See you later. Bye.